Hi guys, it is a fine but soon to be rainy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here in the Catskill Mountains here on this pleasant Wednesday morning, August 28th, 2019, I believe, and uh, I have to go uh, make some big money uh, moving some stuff around. Helping someone move all of their stuff from one place to another place here. So before I get out there and make my riches, I need to do what I do every day, and that's to bring you today's chronicle of the collapse. But before I get into that, I just have several big thank yous to send out today. I want to send out a big thank you to John Patterson. Thank you, John, for your very kind donation to my Patreon account. You are certainly a member of a very small exclusive club on the planet, which I am trying to grow, by the way. And I would also like to thank Frederick and the little dog's Auntie Susan, both for their kind donations to my work here on YouTube and to anyone who has ever found it in their hearts and wallets to donate <coughs> to what I do here on YouTube. I really, really appreciate it. And speaking of thank yous, once again, I need to send out a big thank you to Lieutenant Aaron from Florida <coughs> for uh, digging up what might be the single most spot on um, climate change rant that I have seen in a long time. I was, my chronicle of the day was going to be about uh, retreating, retreating from the oncoming climate disasters, which is exactly what I'm doing by selling my house in Texas, about having to get out of Dodge while you still have time so you're not doing it in a panic a few years from now, but we're going to put that one on the back burner because uh, Aaron has stumbled on to this article out of good old Grist magazine from a climate activist. I don't think this man's a climatologist, but a climate activist who I need to interview here on. Uh, Collapse Chronicles. His name is Adam Sachs. Adam Sachs, S A C K S. And congratulations to Adam and good for you, Grist Magazine, for having the courage to publish this The Fallacy of Climate Activism. Yes, thank you for a. This is our daily dose of reality. Uh, I like underneath the fallacy of climate activism get your daily dose of good news <laughs> subscribe yeah anyway <clears throat> take it away Adam in the 20 years since we climate activists began our work in earnest the state of the climate has become dramatically worse and the change is accelerating this despite all of our best efforts. Clearly, something is deeply wrong with this picture. What is it that we do not yet know? What do we have to think and do differently to arrive at urgently different outcomes? The answer lies not with science, <coughs> but with culture. Climate activists are obsessed with greenhouse gas emissions <coughs> and concentrations. Since global climate disruption is an effect of greenhouse gases and a disastrous one, this is understandable, but it is also a mistake. Such is the fallacy of climate activism. We insist that global warming is merely a consequence of greenhouse gas emissions. Since it is not, we fail to tell the truth to the public. I think 
that there are two serious errors in our perspective on greenhouse gases. The first error is our failure to understand that greenhouse gases are not a cause but a symptom and addressing the symptom will do little but leave us with a devil's sack full of many other symptoms possibly somewhat less rapidly lethal but lethal nonetheless. The root cause the source of the symptoms is 300 years of our relentlessly exploitative, extractive, and exponentially growing techno culture <coughs> against the background of 10 millennia of hierarchical and colonial civilizations. This should be no newsflash but the seductive promise of endless growth has grasped all of us civilized folk by the collective throat, led us to expand our population in numbers beyond all reason and to commit genocide of indigenous cultures and destruction of other life on earth. To be sure, Global climate disruption is the number one symptom. Well, I would say the sixth mass extinction is the number one symptom, but this is Adam's rant, not mine. <clears throat> to be sure, global climate disruption is the number one symptom, but if planetary warming were to vanish tomorrow, we would still be left with ample catastrophic potential to extinguish many life forms in fairly short order. Deforestation, desertification, poisoning of soil, water, and air, habitat destruction, overfishing, <coughs> and general decimation of oceans, nuclear waste, depleted uranium, and nuclear weaponry to name just a few. While these symptoms exist independently, many are intensified by global warming. Thank you, Adam. Global warming as we go into the 21st century will be a threat multiplier. It will exacerbate all of the other symptoms taking down the planet. We will not change course by addressing each of these as separate issues. We have to address root cultural cause. The second, era, er, the second error is our stubborn unwillingness to understand that the battle against greenhouse gas emissions, as we have currently framed it, is over. It is absolutely over and we have lost. We have to say so. There are three primary components of escalating greenhouse gas concentrations that are out of our control. The first is that generally speaking the effects we are seeing today, as dire as they are, are the result of atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide in the range of only 330 parts per million, not the result of today's concentrations of, uh, for some reason, he is saying 390 when it's closer to 415. Maybe this article, it's, it's dated as of four days ago, but it might be a reprint from an older article. I don't know why he would be saying 390, where it close to 415. Anyway, this is primarily a consequence of the vast inertial mass of the oceans, 
which absorb temperature and carbon dioxide and create a roughly 30 year lag between greenhouse gas emissions and their effects. We are currently seeing the effects of greenhouse gases emitted, you know, 30 years ago. And again, he says before 1980, obviously this uh, article was written about uh, 10 years ago. I don't know why it's dated, uh, but anyway, every single thing that's in this article uh, in, in 2019 is uh, every bit as uh, more true today uh, than when it was written. So I'm going to, uh, I, I, I don't know how I have never found this article or even heard of this guy, but despite when the article was written, <clears throat> let's get back to it. Just as the scientific community had not realized how rapidly and extensively geophysical and biological systems would respond to increases in atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations, we currently have only a rough idea of what <clears throat> that 60, now 75 parts per million already emitted will mean even if we stopped emissions today. But we do know with virtual certainty that it will be full of unpleasant surprises. And from that we can thank the positive feedback loops. The second out of control component is positive, otherwise known as amplifying feedback loops. The odd thing about positive feedbacks is that they are often ignored in assessing the effects of greenhouse gas emissions. Our understanding of them is limited and our ability to insert them into an equation is rudimentary. Our inability to grasp them, however, in no way mitigates their effects, which are as real as worldwide violent weather. It is now clear that several phenomena are self-sustaining amplifying cycles. For example, melting ice and glaciers, melting tundra and other methane sources, and increasing ocean saturation with carbon dioxide which leads to increases in atmospheric carbon dioxide. These feedbacks will continue even if we reduce our human emissions to zero. One more time. These feedback loops will continue even if we reduce our human emissions to zero and all of our squiggly little light bulbs, Priuses, wind turbines, Waxman Markies, and Copenhagens won't make one bit of difference. Not that we should not stop all greenhouse gas emissions immediately, of course we should, but that's only a necessity, not nearly a sufficient response. We need to find the courage to say so. And thank you, Adam, for the courage to say so. And since he mentioned Copenhagen and not Paris, obviously this article was not written four days ago. It was written about 10 years ago. Anyway, moving on. <clears throat> the third component is non linearity, which means that the effects of rising temperature and atmospheric carbon concentrations may change suddenly and unpredictably. While we may assume linearity for natural phenomena, because linearity is much easier to assess and to predict, many changes in nature are 
non-linear, <clears throat> often abruptly so. A common example is the behavior of water. The changes of state <clears throat> of water, solid, liquid, gas, happen abruptly. It freezes suddenly at zero degrees C, not at one degree, and it turns to steam at 100 degrees, not at 99 degrees C. If we were to limit our experience of water to the range of 1 to 99 degrees, we would never know of the existence of ice or steam. <clears throat> This is where we stand in relationship to many aspects of the global climate. We don't know where the tipping points, effectively the change of state, are for such events as the irreversible melting of glaciers, release of trapped methane from tundras and seabeds, carbon saturation in the oceans, Difficult to pin down tipping points may be long past or just around the corner. <clears throat> As leading climatologist Jim Hansen has written, quote, present knowledge does not permit accurate specification of the dangerous level of human-made greenhouse gases. However, it is much lower than has commonly been assumed. If we have not already passed the dangerous level, the energy infrastructure in place ensures that we will pass it within several decades." Close quote. <clears throat> and he has an excellent, excellent um, description of notes and links to all of this at the end of this long essay. The most expert scientific investigators have been blindsided by the velocity and extent of recent developments and the climate models have likewise proved far more conservative than nature itself. Given that scientists have underestimated impacts of even small changes in global temperature, it is understandably difficult to elicit an appropriate public and governmental response. <clears throat> we climate activists have to tread on uncertain ground and rapidly move beyond our current unpleasant but comfortable parts per million box. Here are some things we need to say over and over again everywhere in a thousand different ways. Bitter climate truths are fundamentally bitter cultural truths. Endless growth is an impossibility in the physical world always, but always ending in overshoot and collapse. <clears throat> collapse with a bang or a whimper, most likely both. We are already witnessing it, whether we choose to acknowledge it or not. <clears throat> because of this civilization's obsession with growth, its demise is 100% predictable. We simply cannot go on living this way. Our version of life on earth has come to an end. <clears throat> Moreover, there are no free market or economic solutions. And since corporations must have physically impossible endless growth in order to survive, corporate social responsibility is a myth. The only socially responsible act that corporations can take is to dissolve. We cannot bargain with the forces of nature. 
trading slightly less harmful trinkets for a fantas for a fantasied reprieve. Geophysical processes care not one whit for our politics, our economics, our evening meals, our theologies, our love for our children, our plaintive cries of innocence and error. We can either try to try to plan the transition even at this late hour or the physical forces of the world will do it for us. Indeed, they already are. As Alfred Crosby stated in his remarkable book, Ecological Imperialism, Mother Nature's ministrations are never gentle. If we climate activists don't tell the truth as well as we know it, which we have been loath to do because we, are, we ourselves are frightened to speak the words, the public will not respond, notwithstanding all our protestations of urgency. And contrary to current mainstream climate activist opinion, contrary to all the pointless focus groups, contrary to the endless speculation on correct framing, the only, well, the only way to tell the truth is to tell it, all of it, no matter how terrifying it may be. It is offensive and condescending for activists to assume that people cannot handle the truth without environmentalists finding a way to make it more palatable. The public is concerned. We vaguely know that something is desperately wrong and we want to know more so we can try to figure out what to do. The response to an inconvenient truth, as tame as that film was in retrospect, should have made it clear that we want to know the truth. And finally, denial requires a great deal of energy, is emotionally exhausting, fraught with conflict and confusion. Pretending we can save our current way of life derails us and sends us in directions that lead us astray. The sooner we embrace, embrace the truth, the sooner we can begin the real world. Let's just tell it. After we tell the truth, then what can we do? Is it hopeless? Perhaps, but before we can have the slightest chance of meaningful action having told the truth, we have to face the climate reality true, fully and unflinchingly. If we base our planning on false premises, such as the off-stated stutter that reducing our greenhouse gas emissions will forestall the worst of effects of global warming, we can only come up with false solutions. Solutions that will make us feel better as we tumble toward the end, but will make no ultimate difference whatsoever. Furthermore, we can and must pose the problem without necessarily providing the solutions. I can't tell you how many climate activists have scolded me. You can't state a problem like that without providing some solutions. If we accept that premise, all of scientific in inquiry, as well as many other kinds of problem solving, would come to a screeching halt. The whole point of stating a problem is to clarify questions, confusions, and unknowns so that the problem statement can be mulled, chewed, 
and clarified to lead to some meaningful answers, even though the answers may seem to be out of reach. And now the sun is blinding me. That pesky old sun. Some of our most important thinking happens while developing the problem statement, and the better the problem statement, the richer our response is. That's why framing the global warming problem as greenhouse gas concentrations have proved to be such a dead end. Here is the problem statement as it is beginning to unfold for me. We are all a part of struggling to develop this thinking together. We must leave behind 10,000 years of civilization. This may be the hardest collective task we have ever faced. It has given us the intoxicating power to create planetary changes in 200 years that under natural cycles require hundreds of thousands of millions of years, but none of the wisdom necessary to keep this Pandora's box tightly shut. We have to discover and rediscover other ways of living on Earth. We love our cars, our electricity, our iPods, our theme parks, our bananas, our Nikes, and our nukes, but we behave as if we understand nothing of the land and water and air that gives us life. It is past time to think and act differently. If we live at all, we will have to figure out how to live locally and sustainably. Living locally means we are able to get everything we need within walking or animal riding distance. We may eventually figure out sustainable ways of move, moving beyond these small circles to bring things home, but our track record is not good and we had better think it through very carefully. Likewise, any technology has to be locally based using local resources and accessible tools, renewable and non-toxic. We have much rethinking to do and relearning from our hunter-gatherer forebears who managed to survive for a couple of hundred thousand years in ways that we, with our civilized blinders, we can barely imagine or understand. Living sustainably means, in Derek Jensen's elegantly simple definition, that whatever we do, we can do it indefinitely. We cannot use up anything more or faster than nature provides. We don't poison the air, water, or soil, and we respect the web of life which we are, of which we are an intricate part. We are not separate from nature or above it or in any way qualified to supervise it. The evidence is ample and overwhelming all we have to do is be brave enough to look. How do we survive in a world that will probably turn, is already turning for many humans and non-humans alike into a living hell? How do we even grow or gather food or find clean water or stay warm or cool while assaulted by biblical floods, storms, rising seas, droughts, hurricanes, tornadoes, snow, and hail. It is crystal clear that we cannot leave it to the technophiliacs. It is human technology coupled with our inability to comprehend, predict, and prevent 
unintended consequences that have brought us global catastrophe culminating in climate disruption in the first place. Desperate hopes notwithstanding, there are no high-tech solutions here, only wishful thinking. The tools that got us into this mess are incapable of getting us out. All that being said, we not we need not discard all that we have learned, far from it, but we must use our knowledge with great discretion and lock much of it away as so much nuclear weaponry and waste. Time is running very short, but the forgiveness of this little blue orb in a vast, lonely universe will continue to astonish and nourish us if we only give it the chance. Our obligation as activists, the first step, the essence, is to part the cultural veil at long last and to tell the truth. Amen, Brother Sachs. And then he has uh, a long, long list of notes uh, and links to all of these other articles and studies uh, that goes on and on. Uh, so I'm going to put the link to this excellent article. I want to give three cheers to Adam Sachs and uh, kudos to Grist Magazine uh, for having the cojones to publish one of the most spot-on analyses. And I say, say I think this was written about 10 years ago, but we definitely need to get Adam Sachs on the show to uh, get the 10-year update on, uh, on this fine essay. And with that uh, out of the way, <coughs> I need to get in my gas-sucking truck, head down the highway, and help this very nice lady move a bunch of stuff. Move a bunch of stuff from one garage so it can move uh, down the road and fill up another garage. Moving stuff around the planet. That is what I am doing now that I have finished chronicling the collapse and I highly recommend you get out there and move your stuff around, hopefully out of the way of the oncoming tsunami. Bye, guys.